So hello everybody. Um, I'm Arnab, and before I get into what we are doing here at Number 26, a brief intro about myself. So I did my PhD last year, and I was working on my topic was more of information extraction, working on the domain of natural language processing, and knowledge base extension. So this is the area I was working on. So I'm here uh, today. I'll be talking about what we are exactly doing at Number 26, and how does data science and Python go hand in hand together, and what you can do, like awesome stuff here. So let's get started. So this is not a new problem. Like we have been banking like for ages now. Like, but like when it comes to like traditional banking strategies or like the way we bank, it's still very orthodox, or I would say like still backdated. Like we are still, like my father still goes to the bank and he was he wants to update his checkbook or something. So it's still not. We are not there yet, but it's the most important activity every person does. Even if you earn some bucks, you want to save it. You want to see, like, okay, how much can I have a budget on, like, every month, every week, things like that. So, just a small statistics. Like, this is from a from a disruption index. So, like, it's it's a very fun fact. So, it's actually true. Like, and what do you, what I mean by millennia is like it's usually our generation X, which you call it. Just look it up in millennia, like on Google. It's like People born after 1980s, so it's not talking of like old people or like like teenagers. Like it's a basically us. So it's a really, really a very alarming number. So why? So th that's the scenario. Like we really, really do not want to do a lot of banking. Like we want to go to the local bank or stand in the queue, wait for hours. No, it's not a possibility. So. We, we launched like a year and a half back, and this is what we have as of now. So just a disclaimer before I go into a bit more details over here, like it's not like a marketing thing, like I want to present like what number 26 does, but in the long run, like after a few slides, what I go into, you would make, it would make sense that why this kind of things are important. So, so first important thing is like we have to have a real-time banking, like we shouldn't wait for three, four days to see like our credit card transaction got through or is it was it cancelled and like wait for ages and then the landlord should see your mail like hey I didn't receive your rent things like that <laughs> second is you should have a very unique login experience like the app should kind of know you it's it's a bank for you it's not like you are there for the bank so the cool thing about here is uh, depending on the location where you log in from if you're in France or if you're, you're in Spain this background image actually changes it's actually a video so it, it's it's a very nice and a simple thing but it really gives you a more personal touch to the whole experience even more important is this putting transactions into a view like you want to see not just where you spent but you, you can see the logos like what kind of transactions we have we have gone through like uh, some, something like uh, it's a food or it's a leisure or these kind of things. Even more, like the more uh, orthodox or the more traditional ways, like you want to send some money to your friend, to your mom. It's as simple as this. You put the number, select the number in the name of your uh, desired recipient, and there you go. You just send it, like in which, which currency or like even if it's abroad, you can just put some, some uh, another euro or like different currencies and you go ahead. Talking even more, like this is actually the best feature I find it in our app. So you go somewhere, you lose your card. What do you do? You need some cash. What do you have? We call it Badzalan. So you can generate this code. You walk to your nearest center, which is shown here with the maps. It can be in German like Rewe, Lidl, or DM, or something like that. You say, like, okay, here is the code, and you have the account in your, the money in your account. I need 50 bucks. I just need a cab to my ho hotel, or like I need to go to the airport. The rare guy would give you some cash. So that's the power of it. Like a shop turns to an ATM for you immediately. I don't think like any bank is giving that to you. I was talking of transparency and like better insights, like how every transaction should look like. This is how we, we have, have it. Like like detailed, fine-grained details, like where you spend, what you spend, wh how you spend it. Um even even more like sometimes you often need a credit amount, like you bought something and you want some a buffer amount, like okay, I need some extra bucks to really have a holiday plan. Well, nobody takes a credit, like well, take it with a pinch of salt, <laughs> but yeah. But let's say you have some marriage or some medical treatment, for instance, like which you need to do, those kind of things. So we also allow these kind of overdraft facilities. 
yeah, going ahead. So these are the things which are there, but how can we actually make it even better? Like this, these are the things which a user should, like everybody should always have it. So in this talk, I would try to touch three main use cases, and I, see, and I, I want to show you like how, come data, how can data science and more so like what I did was in Python totally, how those two come hand in hand to solve these kind of scenarios. So a use case one maybe, let's say. So we have kind of a financial status of different kinds of users. So this is one user, this is another user. This looks pretty nice, very nice trends. And this is like totally like out of the blues, like you have no, it's, it's wrong to say you have no trend, but it's like totally random, it soon looks like a noise. So this is the this is the case. Like it's a different user, different behavior. Every one of us in this room has a different behavior, like a financial pattern, like how we spend, how we save, etc. What's what's the target here? We want to do some customer, like very specific predictions about their future, about their future financial status. Next case. This is I really love it because often I have been in such scenarios like I drank so much one Friday night and the next day morning I just forgot like okay whom I should owe what and where did that money go I withdraw 50 euros I don't see like it's one euro left in my purse I don't know where it went so this is always the case so you really don't want this to happen so what we are looking for is complete transparency like where is that money exactly where is that money I withdraw it's it's nowhere like I should I should be accountable for that what I'm trying to do here is perfect classification or like more like near like very nice accurate like classifiers build classifiers on top of it so that you know where your money went i'll i'll tell this a bit more in details i have detailed slides so just a, just a um, sneak peek so you can send money just as i said like you can send to your friend or your mom some so it's a person to person or it can be a person to let's say your 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 housing agency or like let's say you're paying some esman annual tickets so it's like a body or an institute where you can do a transaction. So it's always between a sender and a recipient. So we, we technically call them as like money beams and we like bank transactions. The third most important, like this is where, like I often talk with other people and this is like, hey, that everything works fine on my laptop, but how do I deploy? This is like over the, over the months since we like started the company, so this is the way we are growing. So just imagine what's going to like, just do the math here and like predict like in next six months, one year, where we are going to go. And so much of volume, like over 15 million transactions we already have. So like this huge chunks of data, like how should we process those like in, in a real time way? Okay, so coming back. So I was, I started with these three use cases. I'll just talk a bit more in details like here. And I, that shows like what, what data science we are doing here. So, the first case, like you want to send, you want to be accountable for whatever you spend, your total transparency. So, let's take the case one where you try to send some money to your friend, totally drunk, which you can see here. Asen, do you see beer? Yeah, somewhere here. So these are the the text which we usually put it like when you're sending some money. We, the app allows you to put some text. It's kind of, of course, optional. But when you when you put something. So you, it's just a word cloud of what are the text people have put there, like when they're trying to transfer. So the idea here is do some natural language processing. What I did was like, this is the standard things, like you just prune off the, the, the stop words in English, German, whatever language it is, and then you try to lemmatize that. You take, take the tokens and you try to see like, okay, what is the, the root form of the word? And what I used was actually WordNet, which is like a syntactic database for, for the English language. And you can also have like synonyms, antonyms, like, OK, if it's a dog, it's an animal as a thing or things like that. So it's hyponyms and hypernyms of those. So once you have some kind of word, like you say, like, OK, m like food for two or like uh, pizza and salad. So this kind of particular, these are the actually instances of concepts. So basically, these are like the concept is basically food. So here you have some examples, like people are actually putting this kind of text. And the good thing about it is like you can actually prune off this from a, you can just also take debit and doctor, and you just try to map with the super concept, like okay, what's the most likely concept this could belong to? And you can actually score it. 
with WordNet, uh, on Python you have this nice library where you can ask for a similarity score. You can say, like, okay, how likely is it like dog is similar to hotels and restaurants? For instance, it would give you a score. Similarly with how dog is similar to animal, it will also give you a score. So you just rank it accordingly and you just take the maximum one. Going further, this is like the first case where you just talk with, uh, you send some reference text. So this is like one of the uh, great signals we used in our app, like because whenever you send some money or some timestamp, this is actually the my analysis analysis showed like the reference text holds a lot of key to it. The second was, as I said, like you're trying to send some money to some agency or you, as I said, like Esban or somebody's taking some money. So this is more of a like a classification task. Like we have different kinds of transactions. Sometimes we are unfortunate enough and we do not have um, this kind of a merchant identifier associated with those, with that kind of a transaction. That's where the problem comes, like, how can we also, because our aim is complete transparency. We need to give people, like, where the money went. For instance, let's say we have a Vapiano here. So Vapiano, we can, we, we have some transactions where we, we know the merchants, we know, like, what type of merchant he is. I thought, like, okay, well, why can't we just build a classifier out of it? Like, okay, if it's a merchant, like, of a certain type, like, Vapiano, okay, there has to be, you cannot have, like, 2,000 euros of bill at Vapiano. It's very less likely. Or, let's say, for iTunes, or, like, iTunes purchase, you cannot have suddenly a huge, yes, there can be, but it's, there is a certain range of values within which, like, iTunes, usually people are buying songs, or, like, doing some app purchase, Usually 1.99, 2.99, it's a certain range. So I build like, okay, you take the type of the, com the, the company, you take the amount, and you try to build a multi-class classifier. So what you have here are like the, like the types of the categories which belongs to her. So um, I was lazy enough not to just reverse encode this. Like one, I think is like ATM transactions, two are for like bars and restaurants, three are like grocery kind of things. And this is basically the confusion matrix. So what the, the system suggests it would, should have been and what the classifier actually outputs. The darker the cell, that means the more accurate you are. So that's what you see. Like I tried out with a couple of different strategies and this is what turned out to be the best. And if somebody has ever worked with Amazon services, so this, is, this, this diagram is given or uh, created by Amazon Web Service, the machine learning, uh, mm, the service, machine learning service. Um, so they are using this multi-class classifier, so I tried to give it a shot, and it works pretty good. Coming next, like, um, so we, we, we also saw, like, different, different, okay, this is the one part of it, like, giving complete transparency. The second is, like, about you, like, forget, like, what you do, or, like, your friends or something, but it's about your own money, where it's going, how is it being drained, or let's say coming to your thing. So behind the scenes, what I'm using is like we had like a, a loads of neural network, nice talks for the last two days. So here, just to be on the same page, I want to be give a very very short thing. It's basically a, a set of set of nodes, and the edges are actually. Uh, trying to take a kind of input from here, and it performs a mathematical operation on it, and it tries to give an output. What we have here are these are the hidden layers, and you have the output layer. So depending on your task, you can have number of out, uh, number of output layers. So if it's like say a binary classifier like zero or one, you can just have two nodes. Or if it's a multi-class one, you can have like A, B, C, D, whatever you want. And depending on like, I think there was a very nice uh, talk yesterday itself like. You see, like out of A, B, C, D, the B has like eighty percent probability. So it's like a, this. This is the classifier which gives a. It should be like B or something. And then the input essentially is the size of the feature set. Okay. Um, so I tried actually both. Like the keyword is like you try to fit this in, and you don't near, really need to have like multi-layered ones. Try with the very basic one, just one layered one, and see how it works. Um, getting like a bit, uh, like, I put this slide, this is, it's nothing to worry here because it's very simple. It's basically, when I, when I said like, it takes the input and it gives an output, so it's basically you have a set of inputs and you have particular weights associated with it. It's just a function which does a aggregation like weighted sum of all these values. So 
this is basically this. So with W1, X1, W2, X2, and you add a kind of bias to it. So what you have is a, is a, is a function, and usually this function can be anything. It's, you just, um, like any standard literature or neural network, you can have a set of functions. So we have a multiple of things, like we don't know the number of hidden layers, we don't know the number of uh, what function should work best. So what I did was came up with a, like a kind of a grid search kind of a thing. So which would say, like, given a set of functions and given a set of um, uh, in hidden, hidden layer size, I would like to find, okay, which gives me the least error. So what I'm using on the back, back end is like Keras. So we have uh, mentioned Keras quite sometimes, uh, quite a lot of times in this um, conference. So basically this is a wrapper, let's say, on top of Tiano or TensorFlow. You can use either of it. Um, this is pretty nice in my opinion because you, it, it, they have a very nice documentation. I really appreciate like one should use it and give it a shot. You have, it's very configurable. You can, you can write your own custom codes wherever you want to and you just make a call nicely. You don't need to use whatever they're providing. That's pretty nice in my opinion. So as I said, like you have a lot of activation functions. It can be sigmoid, uh, rectified uh, linear units, and then um, tan age or whatever you want to. Then is the number of hidden layers, because I was not sure like which would work the best. Is it like one layer, two layer, or like hundreds of layers? You never know. And then is a final called the epoch thing, which is like the number of times, uh, or like say the one pass from the input to the output is defined as an epoch usually. The more you do it, it takes a lot of time, but the added advantage is it, it, it really gives you a better, uh, like gives a better model. Like it, uh, the accuracy is getting better and better, but it really takes a lot of time. Um, so here is a, like a snapshot of like the code. Like it's basically with on Keras. Like you just define. It's like like MACD sandwich. Like you take a bun, you put a salad layer, sauce, another uh, beef. Go on adding it exactly like it. So he, it's the input thingy. So this defines the shape. Like okay, what should be the input shape? Like if you go back, if you just recollect the few slides back. So if you say okay, three inputs and one output. So you just define it as simple as that. So you, here you won't see like any actual numbers because this is actually a snapshot of like a method. So here I'm just passing all the hidden layer possible values I, I wanted to have. Like I don't want to say like, okay, search from one to 1,000. I have a specific set just for time constraint. I don't want to keep the thing running forever. This is how you construct the hidden layer part. And this is finally you had the out outer layer. And when I was running, I had a, a little bit of problem because this part was not there and it was complaining of a callback method. It, it, it didn't find one. So I had to write a small callback, which is like um, kind of uh, telling the training, like when you train it, it helps like to log like what are the errors you, you see like with every pass, what is the loss you incur, these kind of things. And one more important thing is the yes, the dropout. So it's like this like 25% dropout that is kind of telling the network like don't overfit. That's that's a simple thing. Okay. Okay. So what do we do here? Like as we said, like when we are talking of these customer prediction models, like it's about your money. So we just take your data points for for your past from the past, like you let's say days, weeks, or even months. And what we do is like you when you train a model, you take you have n data points. You take the n minus one and you try to find the nth one. So you have you just hold out n, the last one, and you just train on n, n minus one, and you try to minimize the model, train the model in such a way so that the error is minimized on n. Once you have this model, just fit it in, and now predict the n plus one it. As simple as that. How do I know if the prediction is good? Is given by this prediction interval. This is not confidence in interval. Prediction interval is basically, it's it's a it's a guarantee. Like okay. It can be 95%, like within this 95%, I'm confident that my next value would lie here. 85% is this much, 50% is this much. So basically it's, it takes this, like, the last value plus the standard deviation of the, of the whole data set. The smaller it is, and if you can predict within that, it's even better. So don't think like 95% is wow, like it's actually bad, like it's, it's like a very broad, broad spectrum, I would say. And I'll come to this shortly. And this is some of the, the colors have gone totally. Okay, so I just took the, those two users who had this weird, like one was pretty nice, and I think this is a different, 
it doesn't matter. So I'm trying to predict like the next two values, next two, two, two data points. So one which is like always lying in the negative and one who has like a not so bad kind of a balance. This gives you like a nice, and see like they're totally different because both users are totally different, but the algorithm is totally agnostic to it. It doesn't really care like who you are. The third most important part or like let's say where we always suffer, like it's always an issue for us, scalability. So this is like the colorful set of all the tech, like the whole ecosystem maybe is, is there, or maybe did I miss something? Um, so yeah, so we are using mostly Amazon, and I'll just show you like how the whole thing, like you have your models built, you have your algorithms written in Python, how you can just deploy it and run it in parallel, super scalable and totally robust. So anything new here? Like, yeah, Jenkins, I, I'm pretty sure somebody would definitely know it. So it's like continuous integration, so it, you never, you ne really never, never bothered like, okay, I have to manually copy paste from S3 and browse, upload the jar and stuff like that. It's totally seamless and it's totally cool. I would say. Um, so this is like one of the like workflows, or let's say one of the architecture we had. So we used a lot of Kinesis Stream. Kinesis Stream is basically a, um, let's say a pipe where you have data data packets coming in like like in shards, or like and each shard has got a set of data records, and you have like a lot of in custom like record processor from Java or even Python. Python they have this uh, KCL, which is this Kinesis client, which is like. The, the power lifting is actually done by a Java, Java file. Java thing, they don't yet have a like, cool, like a Python client for it. Um, so you have a lot of transactions coming in for users. You write it to the DynamoDB, which is like a columnar database from Amazon. And we have a stream, or like a, which is also another internal Kinesis stream on, on Dynamo, which is like table internal streams. If you say like, okay, it's enabled, so it's kind of, so any application or a consumer can listen to that stream. So you have multiple, like, I didn't talk about this, so this is another functionality, but the time doesn't permit me to speak uh, so much, like all the functionalities we have. I talked about this. So it makes a, makes a call to this machine learning API, and then it tries to predict, like, okay, uh, what would be the, what would be the transaction? So, so you, has, you spend a, you have beer, you send some text to your friend, you're totally drunk, the transaction comes to your database, this, this thing triggers, it categorizes for you, and it just marks it like, okay, that transaction was food, that transaction was beer, or something like that. Another way, like where this neural network thing is coming, we call it the offline thingy, which is not running so frequent, but it's, uh, uh, which is, which is uh, running not so frequent, which we run it like in a perfect interval. So here we use the, um, simple queue service, which is also from Amazon. So the difference here is like, uh, we put all the users who, who made some transactions in a day, and we have our like Elastic Beanstalk, which is totally, like we put it in a, like a scaling group, and once you define a EC2 instance, or a, it's basically a box, you can choose when you create an instance, if it's a, a Fedora, or like RPM, or Debian, whatever package, um, kind of box you want, and you say like, okay, you should scale, and it's very pretty nice, like if somebody worked with it, you can say like, okay, if the CPU is 30% for the last five minutes, add five more instance and keep on doing it. You can also put a threshold on the upper limit. Like, okay, I want maximum 100 instance, 1,000 instance. The more you pay, the more you get, simple. Um, so here is a Docker. I'll just show you like how our live Docker image looks like. So the moment you deploy, so there's this Docker image which pulls all the things you need. Okay, I need to beep install, blah, 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 blah. And then you say, okay, run this thing. And so this, every image is basically, has this, this part of code. So this Python code I showed you, which is making a call to Keras on top, on, and this is having uh, Theon on his backend. So this is actually the, the Docker image we are using. So basically there's some, like the, the developer li libraries, which I think pretty, like all of us have often faced, like okay, this is missing, that is missing, blah, blah, blah. Um, and these are the set of dependencies or the libraries you need to do. And this, this thing is pretty important because initially I was not having this, but this kills the build time. Like once you do the, you build the image, there is no need to repeatedly grab that like, okay, once it's downloaded, you don't need to grab again Keras and uh, compile it from scratch. So if you just put this thing, it would make it really, really fast, really fast. It, it just takes a cached copy of it. 
And then you say, like, okay, put this application here. And, uh, and you say, like, okay, that's my working directory, and you just have to expose a port. And you just say, like, okay, what's the file or the, what's the Python code you actually want to run? So it's like Python app server. That's how you would run from your own local machine, like Python, mm, dot py. And here you have all your logic. Maybe it's, it's, a, it's a RESTful API or something. You say, like, okay, slash users, slash run, something like that. And then that Python script would do what it needs to be done, like run, grab all the transactions, run the neural net, things like that. Uh, so this is actually the kind of the deployment lifecycle that we maintain. So with GitHub, we have a webhook. So anything we push it there, immediately it notifies the Jenkins. Jenkins spawns it's like, OK, we start building it, this stuff. And just recollect, we, we just saw like these steps, like these are the things it, it does one by one. And that's exactly what you see in the Jenkins console, like it does using a cache. So pip install this, this, this. It's, and once it's, when it's, once it's done, it tries to deploy it on the Amazon instance. So the trick here is you need to have an application or an environment name. So, and that name said, let's say, name Tom. And Jenkins, you say, like, okay, once you're done, deploy it to Tom. That's, that's as simple as that. So you try to fetch it. Usually, you give, if, you do, if you make some mistake, you'd complain. And it's very nice that you'd say on a console, like, application Tom was not found, things like that. So till this part, OK, we are deployed on Amazon, and we show it, showed it in the last few slides and how it scales, basically. Like, so the moment you have too many requests, as I said, you can, you can configure your scale, uh, scaling issues like that. If you have more than 30%, like, too many requests coming in for five minutes, just add five more instances. So when you say five more instances, it just grabs the, this Docker image and it says, okay, copy one, two, three, four. That's it. So you have like five instances doing the same thing for you immediately. Okay, so like summarizing like what we talked about so far, so basically it's not just about what we are doing as data science, but it's also that I really think like this is one of the biggest things, but since like deployment, like how to run it in production is always an issue. It's like, is it the old one in the new Flask, like the Python Flask, which was like, <laughs> and uh, yes, like the users first is our always approach. So we don't want to make some solutions or like which, which, which are not like, uh, everything is centered around the user. So what he wants, what he needs, what are his needs, what are his budgeting needs. Like it's a banking app around the user. So we try to cater to that like accurately. And this is like seamless integration. Like we don't need to bother about like if tomorrow we need to roll out something immediately. So it's there is no human involved anywhere. You write your scripts, upload it there, and then you're done. Okay, and that's what we are. I am here looking somewhere else. And yes, we are hiring. So please send us your CVs. Just go to our site, number 26.d and just look for your favorite job and just click apply. Thank you so much for your patience. OK, thanks a lot, Arnab. I think that was really cool to see your setup and the first question is already coming in. Uh, thank you for the interesting talk. Just a quick question. How do you handle uh, deployment and versioning of your actual model objects? Uh, as I said, like this modeling of this, uh, the neural network models, I really do not care like the, which version do I need because it's about you. If you made 10 transactions today, my model which I built last night is obsolete. How do you manage deployment then? Just that part of the question. Yes, so when I run it, so that batch thing or the offline thing runs every day, every night, when is the transaction is at the lowest point. So it sees your transactions, builds a model out of it, and you just store it. Because the app or the feature we have is like a monthly prediction thing. So let's say we run it, say, first of month, and you say, okay, depending on your last end transactions, we predict like next end of this month, it would be X amount. Yeah, yeah. I, understand that. Well, I don't know, maybe I'm phrasing the question in a wrong way, but when you train the model, you then save it on S3 and when you... No, I don't save it on S3. I don't. So when you deploy a new Docker container, a new instance of the app, where does it get the model from and how does that work? When you, when you deploy the new, new container, so it's a... Um, okay. So you have a lot of requests coming in. So you have a user. So you have, like, say, a lot of hundreds and thousands of users. For each user, when, when, when the Docker container, this Python thing is running, so the Keras thing builds and it builds a model out of it. 
and it predicts what would be your next value, and it stores in the database. So the ah, okay. So you don't actually store the model. No, you just no. I just throw the prediction. Get all the data. Yeah. Build the model. So if it's a monthly prediction, sort of, I really okay. don't care. Like okay, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, if you make some purchase, I'm 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 robust to that, because okay. it's so I don't. That would be stupid. Like if I see your and go on updating, so it would be more and more accurate. But if it's let's say a weekly prediction, so I have to run it more frequently for you. Basically, yeah. so our our use case or the feature we have is like a monthly prediction thing. So okay. we just create uh, content and say, okay, this is your prediction X. And you just store it. So no question in the back. Uh, thank you for the talk. Yeah. Um, did you also try TensorFlow? No. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Did you also talk uh, try cafe? <laughs> no, because uh, when I read up uh, initially, it was like Tiano was like more of an academic choice, and it seems pretty good. And I, when I looked up the documentation, I liked it. Okay, give it a shot. Okay, yeah, like whatever it needs to get the things done and with a reasonable amount of accuracy. Here's another question. Yeah, I have used Theano a bit, and I can see why you'd use Keras. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, classifying merchants. Um, what kind of features are you looking at? Are you like, do you have a string that you're tokenizing? Are, are you using other feature data as well? Like, how does that? How does that? Actually First work? is like the time of the transaction. It occurs usually. Like, and then um, for instance, usually pip like usually it's not like a hard truth like. Online shopping can happen at any point of the day, but let's say some some Netflix or like a, a normal transaction, which is usually occurring during the business hours, that could be one lightweight feature. Second could be the amount of transaction. Okay. The third would be like if you just bit of tokenize it. Sometimes uh, <laughs> telecom service. So this telecom already gives you a high signal. So it really doesn't matter like X Y Z telecom or something. So a bit of tokenizing can also help there. Do you feed any like I guess what I call prior information in? Like, uh, we def just definitely know that this this string corresponds to this merchant. So, uh, so almost I like short. Try to right? learn, and because we also have an option, like okay, if my classifier goes wrong, user can actually say, okay, hmm, that is not category A, it's category B. Now that's a actually a very valuable source of information because that's the basic truth. From next time onwards, when I learn something, I say like, okay, that thing was mapping to B. Prior information, that's actually a sad story because we really don't have like an exhaustive list of um, like merchants to its category. MasterCard has an API. It's really, really expensive. Really expensive. I don't know why. But uh, there are some like, and also like you have some for US companies, but in Germany you have like a different set of companies. And let's say uh, people making a purchase in Greece, you'd have a different set of companies. So. A direct mapping, or you have to have like a super exhaustive set of merchants. Unfortunately, that's not. If you have it, I would be super happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Okay, then I would suggest that we thank Arnab again. Thank you.